Hello, and welcome to Into the Terminal. I'm your host, Scott McBrien. Joining me today is producer Eric, because Nate decided to not be at work today because he's taking vacation. I don't even know what that's about. Yeah, I'm not sure who approves that. <laughs> yeah, his boss is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> today, we're going to be talking about building golden images. And producer Eric, the IT guy, is going to show us uh, the image builder utility that comes with all Red Hat Enterprise Linux systems. Well, not all. How about RHEL 8 and RHEL 9? There you go. Yeah, so uh, so when Nate's away, producer Eric is going to talk about things that producer Eric's excited about, and that includes image builder. Uh, we've talked on this show and on RHEL Presents in the past about the image builder uh, that's built into RHEL. It's part of the web console. There's a command line option as well. Um, but what I'm showing, what we're going to talk about today in the critical path, and we'll we'll discuss this in, in the second half of the show, is uh, some new features that came out in RHEL 9.2 and 8.8 .8 just a couple of weeks ago. Um, so there's there's some future facing operations in this, but we want to start start that conversation now. So what we're looking at is the web console for my uh, single node uh, RHEL 9.2 host. Uh, it's where all my pods, all my Podman containers, uh, all of my virtual machines live for a lot of the demos, a lot of the content that you see. So we're going to go into the image builder application. And Scott, I've, I've got a bit of a problem here. <laughs> see, back in the day when I was a sysadmin, I would be given like 10 or 12 page um, PDFs on how to configure your Red Hat Enterprise Linux system to run a particular workload. Um, one of my first jobs as a Linux sysadmin was uh, managing Oracle Rack databases. And they literally had about a 10-page document about, add these kernel tweaks, make sure these packages are installed, make sure these packages are disabled. If only there was a way, instead of using a PDF, to manually go in and configure that, if I could, I don't know, take that PDF and put it into actual code that I could use. So, you know, interestingly... Uh, image builder command line version has had the ability to ingest a Tomal file for a while to like import a blueprint. But I noticed there's an interesting button here on your page, Eric, that I'm guessing you're alluding to. Could, could it be this brand new, shiny, beautiful import blueprint button? I, I think that might be what you're <laughs> looking for. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is uh, here on my local system, I've actually got a Toml file that I have downloaded from Big Vendor. Um, I, I went in, I made my purchase, and instead of downloading an installer file and a PDF, instead, there's just this Toml file and it said import into Image Builder. So let's try that. So I'm actually going to uh, I'm actually going to upload from my local system here. I've got this very important database uh, Toml file. <clears throat> and so like, like Scott mentioned, uh, the command line has had the ability to produce and in, to uh, import and export Toml files for some, for some time now. Um, so we've got different code here. Um, but uh, maybe, maybe you don't want to read through all the Toml. So let's go ahead and import that file. And you notice we've got a new blueprint here in our image builder uh, blueprints page. So let's go in and uh, let's let's tweak it a little bit here. So one of the things uh, that we'll notice is the vendor has got some file systems that uh, that they recommend. So a lot of the usuals like temp and var log, and it looks like their their application is probably going to live under opt. Don't ask me why big vendor put their application under opt. But I can actually go in and manually configure that. So maybe as a systems administrator, I know that the application we're using is very, very large and that five gigs is not going to cut it. So I can come in here and I, what I'm what I'm able to do here is start building upon what the what the vendor or what my friend or what the sysadmin team has suggested. So oops, I forgot to hit apply. So submit. So I know, so I can I can take these recommendations basically and expand on them, and let's say um, let's say I know that a lot of my systems uh, we have we don't want to use wheel because that's too easy. So we'll create a sysadmin group and we'll give it a group ID because that's the that's the name of the group and the group ID that we use across our entire fleet. So what I'm what I'm pointing out here is that 
we can take uh, we can take this as kind of a uh, a a blueprint, literally uh, as a foundation for what we're wanting to use. <clears throat> and so then, just like uh, just like normal, with uh, with our image builder files, we can actually go in and then start to generate an image. So let's grab let's grab a QCAD two file QEMU. We'll go ahead and keep the defaults. And so with just a couple of minutes, I was able to go in, take a vendor recommended uh, build for Red Hat Enterprise Linux, add a few enterprise specific uh, changes like our sysadmin group or increasing file sizes <clears throat> and then generate an image. So what's really nice is instead of going through manually and adding all of those all those uh, parameter changes out of a PDF. Instead, I can just take a TOML file, make some changes to it, and start building my images. Now I can take this image and deploy it anywhere, whether that's on the cloud, on a private cloud, whether that's our data center, um, and it can be for production, development, and I know that anywhere I deploy this, it'll be exactly the same image. Yeah, and so, um, you know, beyond maybe a... ISV producing this with some recommended practices for how they think um, operating system images should be built for their app. You can also imagine maybe a development team mm -hmm. using that. So <clears throat> if you've developed kind of your standard build for your application, you can actually document it and then import it as a, uh, a blueprint to allow other people to manufacture it as well. Um, so as you move from development to QA to production, you can like push this across um, all levels of the of the deployment strata. So that's that's how you can go in and import and modify your uh, configuration files. In the second half of the show, we'll talk a little bit more in depth about what that might mean if you're a vendor or if you're a systems administrator and how you can utilize that. We'll also talk about exporting. Uh, image uh, blueprint files as well. And then will be the time you'll want to jump into chat, share your questions, share your comments. Um, but we'll talk about that after the transition. And Eric, before we transition, the first thing we're going to start off with is a fresh image build, right? So yep. we can like make our own golden image that we can then export later. Exactly. Right on. I feel like uh, after we transition, I should like have a, a sweater on or something. <laughs> Come in and change your shoes. Exactly. <laughs> so, go a little bit deeper into Image Builder. We're going to make our first uh, actual golden image with it. One of the nice things about Image Builder as a technology is that we can produce the same build, but I'll put it in different formats. And we haven't seen that yet, but you may have noticed when Eric was selecting uh, when he's building his image, there's this large menu of outputs that we could do, like an Amazon AMI or a Azure virtual hard drive or a VMware VMDK file. Um, so you can make this template and then output the resulting system build in whatever format you're going to be deploying it in. Um, so don't forget to, uh, to like the episode or choose to subscribe to our channel if you're enjoying so far. Remember, this is the time of the program where we start handling questions from the audience. Uh, I see we have the illustrious Terry Bowling in the audience. He is uh, one of the Red Hatters affiliated with uh, Image Builder. So he is our, our ringer in chat for handling uh, expert questions. Uh, Eric, you want to get us going on our next kind of walkthrough? Sure, I had to refresh my chat there because the only person I saw commenting was me. <laughs> it's like, I'm all alone. <laughs> but yeah, already a big uh, big conversation going. So, all right. So we've we've got a very important database uh, blueprint. We've got my, my home lab uh, base image that I've started working on. I've been customizing packages. I've been uh, building images. <coughs> Excuse me, um, but like like Scott said, why don't we dive in and walk through uh, walk through this step by step? So we'll start a new uh, into terminal. That's awesome. I'm gonna fix that because otherwise it'll drive me crazy. And Eric mentioned that we did an update of Image Builder 
consistent with the 8.8 .8 and 9.2 product releases. And one of the things that came into that was like under the customizations, there's a huge pile of customizations that you can now do that were not available prior to 8.8 and 9.2. Yeah, and we're going to talk about a few of those here as, as we move along. Um, so let's go ahead and hit next. And I actually missed it, Scott. I threw in uh, I threw in a joke into the big vendor blueprint. Uh, they installed Emacs by default. I was going to remove that and add in Vim instead because we all know that Vim Enhanced is the best way to go. <clears throat> so if we add in Vim Enhanced, maybe Tmux, those are those are some of the common packages I'll tend to install. Scott, anything else you want to throw in here? Uh, how about we put in Node.js? That's like the hotness now for development, right? Maybe a web server. I thought it, I thought it was Rust. Oh, well, I'm only if you like C. <laughs> or you used to like C, but now you're too cool for it. <laughs> okay, so we've, we've got some packages in here. <clears throat> and what I'm really excited about is what comes up on the other side of this wizard. Um, so we can go ahead and we can specify a specific kernel. We can add in some kernel command line arguments. I don't have any. Uh, I don't have anything in particular uh, for this. But now, uh, round nine one, I think we added the ability to create custom partition layouts. Maybe this system we need to have a couple of a couple of gigs for home directory. Let's do. A few gigs for temp. We'll start with that. <laughs> now, one of the new features in RHEL 9.2 uh, for the image builder, for the RHEL image builder, is the ability to enable and disable services. So if we if we say we want the cockpit service uh, enabled, and then maybe we want, maybe we don't do a lot of troubleshooting on this node, uh, we can go ahead and have the KDump service disabled. Um, and then we're installing Nginx, so let's go ahead and have that set to auto start. And so that's system services, so that's that's telling system D what to enable and disable. <clears throat> and then under the firewall, we should enable some services. So we've got Nginx on here, so let's do uh, uh, web traffic, let's do some secure web traffic, let's go ahead and put in cockpits, and then maybe our Node.js app talks on a different port. So let's go ahead and put that in there as well. We could also disable. We can add a custom zone. <clears throat> but I really want to get to the other side of uh, the other side of this wizard here. The wizard has has been the same for for a while. We've add, been adding features under the customizations section. But um, we're going to go ahead and create Jim because he's usually my my sysadmin that I add. And now, while you're here, we have had a couple of questions in the chat. Sure. Uh, and I just want to call those out for our deferred viewers. So, Rommel Ruby asks about creating swap file systems. Mm, great question. Uh, so, from what I could tell, it is XFS only at this point. Right. Right now, it's just FX, F, FS. Yeah, that thing. <laughs> I'm trying to produce and, and, uh, and chat as well. Uh, Scott, if you wouldn't mind uh, throwing that question up on the screen, um, I, I got buried in, in all the chat messages there. <laughs> of course, Shantanu wants to disable SE Linux. I, I don't know why we let him come. But uh, yeah, Terry's out there answering questions. Thank you, Terry. Really appreciate you hanging out with us today. Um, so swap space isn't something that is supported right now. Um, it may be on the roadmap. I'll defer to Terry uh, on that. Actually, I think Terry posted something about that Let's see he did indeed um so actually, i thought he did where is he at so uh it is common to not use swap space for cloud instances uh which is why it's not in there uh currently because we initially started image builder to build things like amazon amis and um, uh, Azure virtual hard drives and the like. So we can put in a, a feature request, but uh, but at this point it's just XFS file systems because cloud instances, like you don't really want to use swap in cloud instances anyway that causes mm -hmm. 
like this. Right. And Image Builder kind of started out with the cloud in mind. And then we started getting all kinds of feature requests for things in traditional data centers. So it's like, oh, well, you know, in, in image builder engineering was like, we think people use it this way. But the nice thing about having our development in a place where people can can interact with it, say in the upstreams, um, like I use the Fedora image builder here for my for my laptop here at home. Um, it's it's really, really effective in that use case. So it's it's kind of been adding features as as we have engineering cycles. Their their backlog is um, is incredibly long with all the features that that want to get added. So every re every release, every six months, there's some new new coolness to uh, to be had in in uh, in Image Builder. <coughs> um. So. Looks like some additional conversation about adding disks storage. Uh, Terry's all over that. So why don't we go ahead and finish up our, our blueprint here? Um, we can go ahead and add sysadmins. I don't have any SSH keys. We can add in a time zone. I don't think I saved that. But uh, you can also add in uh, NTP servers. If you have certain NTP servers, like something locally in your data center, um, we can define our keyboard layout or languages and then, um, yeah, and personally, just... I would, we don't have to here, but I would make sure to pull in like, uh, at, at least two NTP servers from the NTP pool, because you know how time is really important to computers, especially for things like SSL, where if there's more than a five minute difference between the local and remote computer, bad things happen. So, uh, <laughs> Ma making sure that you're pulling time from a reliable source is good. Just the other day, my laptop decided it wanted to be in a different time zone, and I tried logging in with uh, with OTP codes, and it it uh, interfered with Bitwarden, and so the codes weren't lining up, and I locked myself out of my a uh, couple of my accounts before I realized that uh, it was a little bit a uh, little off by two hours. <laughs> um, so there's uh, some FIDO devices. Uh, some open scaps, which by the way, open scap uh, profiles built into image builder, something brand new. Uh, I gave a talk on this at Red Hat Summit just a month ago. Um, but teaser, there will be a future rel presents episode covering this because it's a little bit more in depth than than a, a 30 minute episode of of ITT can can support. So keep an eye out for that. I think the blog post is coming out soon, but there'll be a live stream uh, talking about open scap profiles here soon. And so, as you can see, we've gone through this huge list of things. And if you're yep. like me, go ahead. I, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. Find a device onboarding is for the RHEL for the Edge images specifically. You can use it other places, but that's what it's designed for. Um, and then the same thing is true for Ignition, right? That, mm -hmm. uh, that's to like ingest some additional stuff uh, when the machine boots. Yep. Great point. So as as you can see, this was this was a very linear workflow, and uh, I I made a point to point out uh, words are hard uh, a couple of times that like I didn't have my NTP servers uh, addresses handy. I didn't have uh, the the exact format for the uh, time zone uh, handy. So the going through this as a, in a wizard can help get you most of the way there. But if you're like me and you're scatterbrained and you think, oh, I need this, oh, I need that. Wizard isn't exactly the best way to go about that. So, but when I save, one of my favorite, one of my favorite new features in RHEL 9.2 is this card layout that we saw before, because I can go and um, maybe I've maybe I got that IM from from a from the sysadmin team saying, hey, we've updated our NTP servers, so I can come in here and add those in. Um, in fact, I've got those in the TOML file that we were working with earlier. Let me grab that real quick. Sorry, not not my TOML file from my instant message from the sysadmin team. Zero dot rel dot pool dot ntp dot org. Oh, there you go. And one and two and so forth. Oop, not 20. There we go. So now that I've got that information, I can add it in here. What's really nice is you can, it, this allows you to bounce around a little bit. Um, so we, we added NTP servers. Um, maybe... Uh, maybe we're we decided that we want our KDump service, so I can go in there and make that change. 
Um, anything we, else we want to do to our image, Scott? No, but uh, as we're going to start a build, Shantanu asked a question kind of leading up to that. Okay, so what is the proper way to look at image builder logs to see what it's doing, syslog or somewhere else? There is actually a log file under var log, I think it's composer, uh, because under the hood, this is running composer, is the uh, image builder is kind of the package, if you the, the whole package, if you will. Composer is one piece of that. So I believe it's under var log composer. Let me find out. Let me double check here. Because we're using web console and I have a handy dandy terminal here. Oh, you may it's, need to do that. Yeah, I might need to. Let's just do that. Var log. Maybe it's not. Uh, let's see. See, I'm running insights. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good question. Let me let me double check that. I really thought it was composer. Interesting. Well, while you're looking for that, um, Rommel Ruby asks, um, where can I set the distro? The answer that is, is a great question. Um, and, and I get this this question asked a lot. So with the RHEL image builder, so the one that we install locally on a system, um, <clears throat> uh, it only supports what the underlying operating system is. So I'm running RHEL 9.2. So image builder on the local image builder in the command line would only be able to build out images for RHEL 9.x. Um, that said, though, uh, I know we're working to uh, to add additional uh, additional distributions. And in fact, if you go to console.redhat.com and go to the image builder service, you can actually do CentOS stream or any major version of RHEL that is under uh, under its standard 10 year life cycle. So you can go out and build CentOS stream, RHEL 9, RHEL 8. <coughs> uh, and then uh, you can actually install the Fedora image builder if you've got a Fedora, uh, say a Fedora desktop image. Um, and that's how I image my my laptop here at home. And then Rumla actually asked uh, about configuring service uh, sources as well. And we will circle back to that question here in just a second. That's actually part of something I want to show. Um, so we've we've got a bunch of different things in here. And what's great is Image Builder actually does version control on these files. So if I were to if I were to export this make a couple of changes and then export it again, there'll actually be a version uh, a version number that will have incremented. Um, but for now, uh, Scott mentioned that we actually kind of breeze by this in, in, the, uh, uh, in the critical path, but we've got a ton of different options. Uh, so different QCAT2 files like we did earlier. Um, as a sysadmin, I spent a lot of time doing VMDK files. So I can go in here and I can actually tie in my uh, my vSphere credentials into here. So it would give me the option to uh, to put in the destination and an account that has the ability to upload images. Or we could do um, we can do AWS with similar uh, with a similar setup. <clears throat> I don't have my uh, or we could do like an edge installer image. Um, that's not going to. Give me something quick. And, there we go. Or just a traditional rel installer. So it would give me an ISO that I could then put on a USB stick or upload to a hypervisor. And for some reason, it's not letting me click next. I don't know if I lost my connection. Nope. Interesting. Well, why don't we use a uh, QCAL2 image? Because that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> but yeah, if you, depending on the instance that you or the <coughs> use, you can have some additional dialogue for interacting with that thing. So for like, it's not just uh, Amazon, but for Azure, we also have the ability mm -hmm. to tie in an account key and some other stuff to automatically, when it's finished building the image, to go ahead and push it into your um, designated storage that you told it uh, after it's done building. And then uh, the service has support for GCP as well. So it's uh, AWS GCP Azure with more on the way. Um, so tons of different places you can, or tons of different formats that you can export these images to. Um, 
And so, then back to Shantanu's question about logs, <laughs> when we were building that image, there was a uh, download logs. And you can also, I think, toggle open something that actually shows you the um, shows you the status of it. So it'll actually download a dot log file, and uh, or what we can do, or we used to. Hmm. Oh no, that's in the service. Sorry, I, I I get the two conflated. On on the service, you can actually click into it and and watch the progress as it as it goes goes forward. Uh, so the image builder service and the rel image builder are actually built by two different teams. And so over the course of the next few releases, you'll kind of see those feature sets uh, converge a little bit. So uh, there'll be more feature parity. Uh, <laughs> no, th see the earlier conversation about how we've got. Um, we started out with like a cloud focused approach and then realized, oh wait, this works really, really well in the data center too. So the reason why we went through that through that process was one to show some of the new features in RHEL 9.2, but also to get to this point where we can actually export that blueprint. And so here's here's that <coughs> TOML file that, that uh, you saw us working with earlier from our very important database. Uh, yeah, very important database file. Or we can also export this in JSON, so whichever your, your preference would be. And then once we download it, we can <clears throat> file to somebody else, and then they can import it on their system using the import blueprint button. Mm -hmm. So now that I've got my blueprint, um, I want to circle back to Rommel's question about sources. That's something else that's new in 9.2, so we can actually add a custom source. So the first thing that people will probably think about is the Apple repository, the extra packages for enterprise Linux. Um, so what we'll do is we'll give it a name, something that we can recognize. Then we need to bring in the URL for uh, Apple 9. And um, then we're going to choose, uh, this is a yum repository that we're pointing to. We'll check the SSL signature and the GPG key for security. And if we hit submit, now we can start adding packages into our builds from, say, the Apple repository. This is also really, really helpful if you've grown an application in-house and uh, and you've got your you've got your uh, all your application and its dependencies in its own repository on, a, say, a local system. Maybe you've got a jump server or something where that uh, code lives. So you can actually add that as a source in Image Builder to then deploy your custom build application. So Eric, can we now go back into our ITT image and add something like uh, moon dash buggy? <laughs> Scott loves to play his terminal games. So if we go back into blueprints, go into the terminal, and then go to edit. Actually, I think we can do it from this screen too. Oh, maybe not. Okay. Uh, let's see. Packages, number two on the list. And then we go, you said it was moon buggy? Yep, moon dash buggy. So it's it's taking a little bit to come back uh, because now it's now it's checking out that new source uh, that we just added and is doing an inventory of of uh, of all those packages and there's something like twelve thousand packages or something in an Apple, which may be why we're seeing mixed results here. It says it's still thinking. Not something like HTOP. Interesting. To be fair, I've I've had uh, connectivity issues today, so that may be why it's why it's taking some time. I mean, it's a live demo, Eric. What could possibly go wrong? Right, and and I blame uh, Shantanu who who made that very same comment just a couple of chat messages ago. So, uh, so it may just be taking some time for that uh, for that manifest to to be parsed through. Uh, but we are we are getting close to time. So one of the thing, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this is that as a former systems administrator that worked on other teams of systems administrators, it would have been so nice to have this functionality so that we can build our base image, put it on, put it on something like a local GitLab or some kind of a some kind of a uh, file share with systems administrators, <coughs> and be able to pull the exact same image or as a systems administration team to build the base image and then send it to our DBA team to have them install the database or to have them configure the blueprint with the database, with all the packages. Um, 
and then uh, and then not only would you have the default golden infrastructure image, but that you, you can start adding layers to that cake. Uh, so your DBA team could have their image that is that is a derivative of the base image. Then you can have an applications team that has their derivative of the base image. So you can really start importing and exporting uh, blueprint files so that ex no matter where you're deploying, whether that's cloud, whether it's AWS or Azure, or whether it's a data center, maybe you're running a private cloud, something like OpenStack or VMware, You've got the exact same images with the exact same configuration deployed in multiple spaces. And if you happen to be listening to this and you're an ISV or one of our software partners, that, that critical path was, was for you all. Just think how much easier it would be for your customers to run the actual certified, the actual pre-configured images using Image Builder. So you literally, instead of instead of sending an ISO file or an MSI or or an R RPM or whatever you're packaging, sorry, MSI was Microsoft. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, but you instead of prepackaging all of that, and then adding a uh, adding a dozen page PDF and a license key, instead you just build out this TOML file, walk through this walk walk through this. Um, uh, walk through the, this exact process, and then you can share that with your customers, and you can iterate it on it. Then they can take it and add additional, um, and then they can add additional um, flavor to those images for for their for their custom enterprises. <coughs> All right, so I think that runs us off the end of our episode agenda. Uh, great interactions today in the chat. Thank you for our live audience. For those of you who are watching Deferred, don't forget to uh, to like and subscribe so you can see more of our content in the future. Um, do we have an episode for next week, Eric? We do. Uh, Nate, I think, finally decided he'll come back to work uh, next Friday. And Scott and Nate will be talking about building applications with RPMs. So I think we're going to do a few episodes around uh, actually building and deploying packages. So uh, some RPMs, maybe some container magic. Uh, who knows where, where the future will take us. <coughs> All right. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, Eric, thank you for stepping in for Nate. Man. Anytime. One day, one day he'll show up to work. And <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, you and Nate both left me last week. I don't know if I describe what I had as a vacation though. But <laughs> That's fair. Um, all right, everyone. Well, we'll see you next week when we start talking about uh, packaging up different uh, applications and different formats. And uh, until then, happy terminaling, everyone. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll workshop that. <laughs> we'll see you all next week. <laughs>